Right, so we've got uh, our abstract, I don't know if you've seen it, we've got a kind of a four-stage process to walk through with you today. Uh, it's going to be rather informal, at least my ends of it will be. Uh, Stuart uh, is maybe got a more prepared paper, so that might be actually clearer and better, so maybe I'll let him do most of the talking. The four things we wanted to do is give you a kind of brief history of the key concepts of phenomenology, and apologies if some of this is known or repetitive to, to you all. It's a, as you can see, maybe a very mixed audience, so we're kind of pitching across uh, levels and across uh, scales. We wanted to give you a brief history of the key concepts of phenomenology, uh, specifically uh, framed, as Stuart will talk about, by a core concept of intentionality, and that's something you've been working on uh, uh, closely of late. Uh, and so he'll walk us through that. I've got maybe three, four minutes, maybe, uh, just to give a quick overview, a kind of tip of the iceberg, on the ways in which key uh, sources, key books, uh, the ways in which phenomenology has had uptake in performance studies, particularly theater and dance, and apologies to <coughs> colleagues in music or other disciplines here because I've not really touched uh, on that, so you might be able to, uh, to help fill in some of the gaps uh, there. But just by way of saying, okay, you know, this is what phenomenology is, and uh, here's the way it's been taken up in some strands of uh, performance uh, studies. And then we'll move on to two slightly more substantial uh, offerings, as it were. Uh, Stewart's uh, paper uh, on uh, the, performative uh, the performative imperative in Heidegger, and working through some of the sites specific performance that you've done lately, right, uh, Stuart? Yeah. Uh, okay. And then uh, we thought uh, we'd move from that, and I would give you a sense of uh, the application of phenomenology to Shakespeare by way of modeling how we might use some of this material in a specific uh, performative context, as it were, a specific convention of theater. Uh, actually, both of our uh, offerings will, will do that uh, from different ends of the spectrum, uh, as it were. But the idea there is, you know, broad overview of what some of the principal concepts are and then how we might use them in specific work. Uh, what I'm going to talk about will be actually a book project that I've been developing for a little while, so it might be a little bit broad-based, but uh, we'll try to delve into details and in questions and answers. And what but I will talk about in that point is uh, <coughs> the way in which the fundamental concepts of a certain period of Heidegger's work gave rise to the possibility of a performance methodology. Yeah. That's what I'll be talking about. Yeah. All right, so you want to kick off with, yeah, uh, sure. with, with the basics, as it were? All right. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, what do you know about phenomenology? Who am I talking to? I, do, I don't want to insult you by being too dumb. I don't want to um, talk stuff you don't <coughs> never heard of. Who, who knows what intentionality is? Just anybody? No? Okay. Um, if I said the difference between the psychological and the phenomenological reductions, eidetic reduction. Okay, good. All right. That's, so I'll um, uh, try not to bore you with jargon that is completely irrelevant. Um, it is customary. <laughs> 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 it is customary to begin any general <laughs> talk on phenomenology by noting its irreducible and intractable heterogeneity, methodologically, ontologically. Um, but I think that's bullshit. I think that uh, phenomenology can be reduced to a few basic impulses, concepts and approaches. And even though in the... Uh, in the history of phenomenological philosophy, there's people who are groundedly Cartesian, there's people who are, uh, are absolutely perspectivist, there's people who are talking about place, people who are talking about uh, mysticism, people who are talking about um, how do I have a cup. The range of uh, interests is really wide, the approaches are really wide, but I reckon there are three things that all phenomenological work shares. One, it's always got some kind of reductional imperative. Now, I'm not saying reductionist or reductive, I'm saying reductional. Specifically referring to Husserl's methodology of the reduction, which even though most people after Husserl don't use the term the reduction, 
They all work towards the imperative of the reduction. And I think nobody put this more clearly than Michel Dufresne, who wrote The Phenomenology of Aesthetic Experience. He was an existentialist phenomenologist in France in the 1950s. Um, Dufresne said, phenomenology is a description which aims at an essence. So phenomenology, I believe, is profoundly <coughs> essentialist. And, uh, and I think that all phenomenology tries to get down to basic principles. That's number one. It's reductional. And that doesn't mean that it believes that it can ever get there. Most Husserl scholars will, talk, will quote him by saying, it is an infinite task. You never get there. You can't actually find these things, but it has an, uh, an impulse towards the reduction. And within that Dufresnian uh, definition as well, he talks about description. I think phenomenology always tries to make as basic a description of possible of phenomena in the world. And I think the third thing is that all phenomenology bears some relationship to the idea of intentionality. That's the third. And that's the one I want to talk about today because I think it contains the other two. So intentionality. Husserl said, there will be a science. It will be the science of all sciences. It will be called phenomenology and it will be the science of intentionality. That's how important. Husserl invented phenomenology as we know it today and he said phenomenology is the study of intentionality. So, brief history of the concept of intentionality. There was this guy called Descartes. <laughs> Descartes said cogito ergo sum. What that means is, as I'm sure you all know, the only ground of absolute certainty that I can have is that I am here, I am having this experience, it is me, the subject. The birth of subjectivism, I'm not sure that that chair's there, I'm not sure that Patrick even exists even though there is sufficient evidence to suggest that I may be able to come to a conclusion that he does exist and even though I don't know what he's thinking I can sort of tell what sort of a thing he is and what, how, uh, what he may be even thinking about me because of that look on his face unless he's a particularly good actor or blah 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 blah. But the only thing I know is that I'm actually thinking all this stuff. That's the only thing I can be certain of. That's what Descartes said. In doing that Descartes was looking for the ground of certainty of knowledge. Trying to ground the certainty of knowledge. A couple hundred years later, along comes Kant. And Kant says, well, you know, if it's all about what's going on in here, if it's all about me and the way I think and know and value and judge and want and desire and love and all of these things, then we should be studying the way in which we know, the way in which we love. And, and so Kant set about trying to put the flesh on the bones of that Cartesian assertion. And he um, did a great job. I love Kant. God, what a beautiful writer. But what, what a mess. And, and, and it is, and it's really, really, Kant's just so dense and so intense that it's like layers and layers and layers and layers of hidden misconceptions and assertions that Heidegger has done the most fabulous job of digging out and unpacking. But anyway, part of the problem with, uh, with Kant came when Husserl came a bit later on and he said, look, Kant's not, not really got any ground in the world at all. Kant's work is pure supposition. What we need to do, if we're studying this, I know, I will, I value, I judge, then we actually have to do it from within the experience of it. We actually have to do this study from within the experience because if I say I'm thinking and this is what I'm thinking about, I'm actually thinking the fact that I'm thinking and thinking about the fact that I'm thinking and so I can't really grasp the whole of the concept of my thinking because I'm, I'm doing it from inside of it. And unless I take that into account then I'm not doing the job properly. And he was a student of Brentano. And he says Brentano's great invention which gave rise to the possibility of phenomenology was Bre Brentano, Franz Brentano, writing in the 1860s in a book called The Psychology of, Imperial, uh, of, Empirical, the Psychology of Empirical Knowledge, I think it's called, or something. He said, 
all mentality has an object. <clears throat> if I know, I know something. If I love, I love something. If I want, I want something. If I judge, I'm judging about something. So Husserl said, if our business in order to get to the Cartesian certainty is to know everything we can about what it means to know and want and love and judge and will and value and we've got to do it from inside, we do it from inside the relation between subject and object. And phenomenology as he proposed it was to be inside that relation between subject and object but kind of off to the side of it running a parallel stream which I'm knowing, I'm knowing, I'm knowing, I'm knowing, I'm knowing, I'm knowing. I'm looking at myself, no. I'm studying myself, no. I'm studying myself, no. Now, studying myself, no. Studying myself, no. It has certain sort of methodological problems. I'm working all of those out as I go, but still, I'm keeping the fact that I know in sight as my main thing. And my friend Pauline Manley, who's a dancer and a phenomenologist, says, I trained as hard to be a phenomenologist as a footballer trained to be a footballer. She said, it's really hard to be in this position where I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it and I'm observing myself doing it and I'm maintaining that distance and I'm getting the skill of shuttling backwards and forwards forth and I'm not making too many ungrounded assumptions and I'm aware when my presuppositions are getting in the way but I'm holding open this intellectual space in which I am doing the thing and studying the thing at the same time. So that's what Husserl did. And then he wrote thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages trying to get to Cartesian certainty and his whole work is a massive tome of failure. <laughs> and he would not admit till the end of his days that you could not get Cartesian certainty. He just kept saying, it's an infinite task and I'm going to get there and I'm never going to stop doing it. And then along comes, he, he had a lot of great students, Shaler, Fink, all of these people who, uh, Edith Stein who studied sympathy and all sorts of things. But his greatest student was Heidegger. And Heidegger said, why bother? Heidegger said, if there is no ground of certainty, then you've got to begin with the unground. And Heidegger was really affected by Nietzsche. He was a Nietzschean scholar and he said, what we need to start with <coughs> is the relativity of everything. What we need to start with is the perspectivism and surely that's the ground of subjectivity. So through the concept of intentionality, Husserl's intentionality was the study of I the subject am having my object in certain ways. The object, I know it, I love it, I will it, it shows itself to me, etc. And so Husserlian intentionality goes, Matt can see that cup. I can see that cup. I can't see anything of that cup that Matt can see of that cup, yet Matt and I somehow both know we are looking at the same cup. This is miraculous, according to Husserl, that we can have this knowledge that we're both looking at the same thing. And even by myself, I look at the cup. That's called a noetic act, by the way. A noetic act, a noesis, is an act of perception. I perceive the cup. Okay, I come over here. I perceive the cup again from a different place and a different time. I put the cup over here, upside down and go like that. And yet I know that I'm always looking at the same thing. And Husserl tried to account for that phenomenon, which was a problem for Hume and for Locke earlier of identity. How do you establish the identity of the object? Husserl's answer to this problem was the noetic, noematic structure of intentionality. That I have separate acts of perception and they join together through a unifying principle called the noema. And as Simon Blackburn in the Dictionary of Philosophy observes, there is no empirical evidence to suggest that any real thing in the world corresponds with Husserl's noema. But nevertheless, this is the noetic, noematic structure. But then Heidegger comes along and says, hang on, it's not about subject and object. That's where the problem lies. What it actually is, is I am in the world with the cup. And the cup is determining me as much as I'm determining the cup. I'm thirsty, I need the water. Unless I conform to the cup and allow the cup to make me, I won't get the water. The cup is this big, I have to hold it as it is. It will hold the water in it, I have to do this. The cup itself is determining my actions. I'm in the world with the cup. 
And in that, Heidegger said, if it is about this relationship, then we need to get beyond subject and object and say, it is a fundamental thing of the human that we transcend towards the world. We are that which goes out to the world. And that's what we are. And you have to begin there. And so because we are in the world and yet we go out to the world, we have to examine the way in which we are in the world. So this was an incredibly profound shift between the Cartesian certainty of wanting to know about value, willing and judging, etc., to how am I in the world with the stuff. That's Heideggerian intentionality. It's a very selective history I'm giving here. I'm only choosing a few examples, just the major ones. And then along comes Merleau-Ponty. <coughs> deeply influenced by Heidegger, but so embarrassed that Heidegger was a Nazi and being a French uh, um, existentialist, having to sort of live with that and, and all the problems associated with that, he goes back to Husserl and creates all this political complexity within the philosophy. Then, and ha the study of Heidegger is completely embedded with all sorts of political um, controversy. And it started back then in the 1940s with the existentialists who were Marxists trying to explain Uncle Heidegger and his association with the National Socialist Party. But so Meloponti comes along and says, no, 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 no. If I'm in the world with the objects, how I have the objects is not by mentality at all. I have the objects with my body. I don't have the cup by going, I know that cup. I will that cup. I value that cup. I have that cup by going, That's how I have the cup. So intentionality is the relationship between the subject and the objects of the world. We're still tracing this history. And he says, I know that I, I, I have that cup because I can pick the cup up. It's within the zone of my body. And he said, this is a really crucial point in the, the origins of spatiality and the origins of how we have the objects of the world that creates a zone. The fact that I'm upright and my arms can do this creates my whole sense of zone and of ability to place. And that's an arc. And he calls that the intentional arc. That if I stand here, the world looks like an arc. And it, I can go here and I have a sense that this is a room. I have a sense that this is a university campus, that this is a town, that this town is near a city, that it's part of a country, that the country's part of a continent, that the continent's part of an earth, and that the earth is part of a solar system, etc. I have that because I can go like that on the cup, according to Merleau-Ponty. The body is the site of the apprehension of the world and the origin of the site of every way in which we apprehend the world. So that's why Merleau-Ponty is the great philosopher of the body. Moving along quickly, the next chapter in the history of intentionality I'll talk <coughs> about is Levinas. And Levinas comes along and goes, no, 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 no. Um, it's, it's all about the fact that if we are in the world, then what we've forgotten about in all of this, we're all still talking about the object, we've forgotten about the fact that we come from the world. And he invents a thing called the intentionality of enjoyment. And he talks about light, sleep, ideas, uh, and a bunch of other spectacles. Light, spectacles, sleep, ideas. And these are elements, and I come from the, from the elements, living from, and he calls it the intentionality of enjoyment, because when I have an apple, I don't know the apple, I don't want the apple, I don't judge the apple, I am with the apple in an elemental relationship, and in that relationship, it becomes me. So I read Kant, and I take those ideas, they become me. These spectacles, I take them off, I look really different, but the whole world's different as well. The spectacles become me. And this is the intentionality of enjoyment, which is a process of nourishment by the world, lived from within the world. So to cap that up, because I think that's, a, that's kind of enough for this first little bit, this little history of intentionality, to me, contains everything that's important about phenomenology. The catch cry of Husserl was back to the things themselves. 
We want to find out about things <coughs> themselves. We can only find out about things themselves from inside the relationship we have with them. And we have here, I've just given you an example of four philosophers, one of whom was a Cartesian, one of whom was a practicing monotheistic uh, Jew, one of whom was uh, a Nietzschean perspectivist, and one of whom was a French existentialist with very kind of strange bubbling Catholic leanings underneath. Um, but they're all partaking in this history of understanding how we have the world and how, how the world have, has us. And um, they're all doing something where they're looking for the essential features of the thing. They're going down and saying, no, no, this is the actual bottom story. And in this story that I've told you, from Husserl to Heidegger to Merleau-Ponty to Levinas, each one's trying to get under the other one to the more fundamental principles. That's what I call the reductional impulse, to try and get more fundamental to say what you think is fundamental, that ain't fundamental, this is <laughs> fundamental, I'll get fundamental on your ass. And, and that's what phenomenologists do to each other each generation. They get more and more fundamental until the greatest phenomenologist of the last 30 years, Derrida, who just out-fundamentalised everybody's fundament until he disappeared <laughs> up his own fundament. And, um, but, oh, and the third thing, they're all describing. They're all describing about what's going on in the world and describing the relationships. <coughs> so that'll do for me now. Matt, take it away. Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, in what Stuart has uh, said, you can hear an awful lot of the key ideas, as you said, contained within uh, this notion of intentionality. But some of these will trace, as I said very earlier, very briefly, maybe five minutes or so, uh, uh, trace through the uptake of phenomenology uh, in the study of performance. And I'll try as we just talk through, this is the tip of the iceberg stuff, it's not meant to be a comprehensive list. The goal here is to give you a couple of titles to maybe attach to some of the ideas that Stuart has been uh, talking about. Um, it's customary, uh, to begin in a similar <laughs> way, uh, it's customary to count the beginning of the uptake of phenomenology and performance studies with uh, Maxine Sheets Johnston's uh, book, uh, Phenomenology of Dance. And it's uh, useful to note that, uh, of course, she is a bit more, uh, maybe more than a bit more, of a philosopher rather than a scholar of uh, performance. Uh, but there is a kind of crossover starting there. Now, I'm not a fan of origins myself or of trying to pinpoint origins, but this tends to be the way in which uh, people think about the, the, the merging of uh, performance studies, not the performance studies, the study of performance with phenomenology. Uh, phenomenology, uh, as Stuart's been saying, was a, a very uh, a complex and in vogue philosophy in the uh, 20th century. It had a, a, a sort of groundswell of interest in uh, performance, uh, marked there in a way by that second bullet point. There was this, uh, and Stuart turned me on to this, uh, a, a couple of decades, particularly at the University of Southern Illinois, which started the Phenomenology uh, Research Center, uh, had over the course of uh, two or three decades, 30 PhD, MA theses uh, connected with this in some way, shape, or form. But as you're probably aware, the uh, position of phenomenology in the study of, of performance uh, also had an awful lot of backlash over the latter part of the 20th century. As uh, Stuart outlined there, it is fundamentally, and as he says, and I greatly appreciate this, unapologetically uh, essentialist, and that was part of the backlash, right? Uh, there's no such thing, postmodernism tells us, as the thing. There's no such thing, right? Uh, it also uh, has a backlash against it in terms of being overly subjective, right? And that is perhaps a very, very uh, valid uh, critique, that it doesn't take into account uh, gender, race, class, the things that cultural materialism started to take into account over the course of the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, all of this uh, sort of contributed to uh, the uh, maybe downswell, if that's a word, of phenomenology over the, the uh, latter part of the last century. Nonetheless, as you see in the 80s there, it was particularly attractive to theater scholars. Bruce Wilshire, 1982, Bert States, who's I usually counted as probably the, the, the sort of preeminent theater uh, phenomenologist uh, of that era, 1985. Uh, in dance, uh, 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 you've got, as I said, Maxine Cheats Johnson starting the Sondra Furlick uh, writing in film. You've got Vivian Sobchak uh, in the 90s. Alice Rayner out of Stanford, where Bert States was as well, uh, kind of uh, created a little uh, cadre of disciples, States did. Alice Rayner was one of them out of Stanford, 1994, has a, a book on uh, the phenomenon of acting, as 
as action, Stanton B. Garner on bodies and spaces in performance, <coughs> Philip Zirilli on acting and embodiment, uh, and then more recently, around uh, the turn of the century, uh, the, there is a much greater uptake again, and we're now seeing uh, almost like the 70s and uh, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we're now seeing an awful lot of research clusters, PhD and MA theses, uh, study groups, networks, uh, such as one that uh, Stuart's running uh, now, a great deal of interest in uh, phenomenology coming through, and a few um, uh, what's uh, the word here? Not quite offshoots, not quite branches, but developments of it in particular areas. So a move into ecophenomenology, which is some of what Stuart will present on uh, very, very shortly, some work there. A, a move towards uh, what Bruce Smith has done, particularly with respect to early modern theater and Shakespeare, but not only there, uh, towards historical phenomenology, trying partly to bring together the concerns of uh, materialist uh, historiography, a sense of how we understand history from a material perspective, and the phenomenological in terms of the essential and the subjective uh, as a way. Right? Uh, and he does some really interesting work in trying to pull that together. And currently, right now, there are, I'm um, aware of, partly because we're editing one of them, partly because uh, another one is coming out this month, at least two collected uh, editions uh, on phenomenology and performance that are uh, forthcoming, a number of other special editions of journals, another one that's forthcoming there, and as I said, multiple uh, groups, uh, research networks, and theses. So, uh, all of that is by way of saying that in the realm of studying performance, there was this kind of uh, ebb and flow, and we are in a, an upswell again now with varying offshoots uh, there. So I think I'll pause on that moment and maybe take that as a moment to take a broader pause and say, uh, ask if there are any sort of questions or concerns about the, the first half of this, and then we'll move into Stuart's presentation and mine. But by way of laying some groundwork, how is all of that? Can Laura? I just say a bit about then how phenomenology responds to those <coughs> criticisms that come out of postmodernism? So, like the critique of mm. um, subjectivism and the critique of essentialism. So, how, how does it amplify? Well, I can, uh, Stuart, you might be able to speak to that in terms of phenomenology. My sense of it in terms of phenomenology and performance, with regards to uh, a kind of uh, the critique against subjectivism, my sense of it is that uh, there is a great, there was a, a significant movement uh, in a kind of post postmodern era, saying that actually the performing arts are subjective. Right? The performing arts are received. Right? by individuals, by audiences. Uh, the, the, the study of the arts is something that individual consciousness consciousnesses uh, approach and uh, uh, try to apprehend. And so there is a value to the phenomenological approach which says, how does this thing in front of me appear to me? Right? Uh, and that's uh, part of the response that has come there. With respect to the critiques against uh, kind of um, uh, the cultural materialist side of it, oh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm less certain about the exact response to that, except to say that I know that there are some movements, like with Bruce Smith and others that actually we've been uh, looking at recently, that say phenomenology is uh, actually very well suited to speak to the specific conditions of a particular uh, culture, a particular society, again because of its desire to understand uh, the way of being in that world. So, uh, Stuart, do you want to add to that? Yeah, the critique of um, essentialism uh, comes from the mid-60s uh, in France. Uh, with the generation after the existentialists. Um, and I think it's really valuable to look at the, the intellectual history of it that really helped me to understand it. That Derrida's first book was a book about Husserl. Lyotard's first book was a book about Husserl. Uh, Deleuze said it all began with Sartre. So these people were the, the students of phenomenologists. And these were the ones that began the criticism. And so What's happened in the last five years is people from within the phenomenological discipline, the, the ph within phenomenological philosophy, have been returning particularly to Derrida and looking at his criticisms of groundedness and ungroundedness. And, um, and there's two kind of conclusions that people are coming to. One is what he was doing was just taking that 
when I talked about the failure, the, the failure of Husserl's Cartesianism and the, the unground of Heidegger, Derrida took the next most fundamental step from there. Now the people who in the 1980s took over institutions of literary studies and the birth of performance studies in universities in, uh, in America and in Europe and more, more in America and in England and in Australia as well, encountered this stuff through, particularly through Derrida's critique of it. And so they began to repeat Derrida's critiques of it without having Derrida's groundedness in it. And so that perspective that Derrida is actually part of a long tradition. Um, and of those three people that I mentioned, Lyotard and Deleuze made a bit more of a, a, a rejection than Derrida. Derrida was more of a development. But there's that one idea that they, they didn't have the full story. And the other one is, particularly in regard to Heidegger, since 1990, so these critiques that you're talking about began in the late 1970s and went through, they're still alive. Since the late 1990s, there's been whole bodies of Heidegger's work that's been released for the first time and then translated for the first time. And it's come to the fore that for Heidegger, essence was always a verb. Essence was always essencing. Essence for Heidegger means fundamental occurrence. It's not about getting down to some substance. It's about looking at something in the process of what a Deleuze, what Deleuze would call becoming, and Heidegger would reject the term becoming because he said through becoming, Nietzsche wasn't being fundamental enough. Um, but so what is actually happening, if you go to a conference like SPEP, you'll see a few papers more and more of phenomenologists assessing this critique from within the tradition and saying, one, it's through an inadequate knowledge of the tradition, and two, works that have come to light in the last 20 years answer it back, particularly in Husserl's case, ideas too. You know Merleau-Ponty's thing about the two hands touching? Anybody heard of that? That's in Husserl's book, Ideas Too. Merleau-Ponty stole it. Merleau-Ponty stole Ideas Too. Ideas too is all about the body, and Husserl wrote it. But these things have only been coming to light in the last 20 years, and the critiques are older. That's, that's what it looks like to me. And, and I would add to that just very briefly, that I think it's probably fair to say that in many respects, as we're seeing evidence, that those critiques are actually taken on board uh, by phenomenologists uh, and saying, okay, so let's consider not just the body as Merleau-Ponty would, but the gendered body. Right, uh, uh, but we can still uh, ground a, such a consideration in a phenomenological approach. Mm. And so, a huge, so, in mm. that, a huge leap forward in Tony Steinbock's book Home and Beyond, which he, where he, he finds a thread in Husserl that he calls generative phenomenology, which is a phenomenology of difference, which is the phenomenology of home ground and alien ground, of self and other. And uh, he, and that's really being taken up. There's a conference on at the moment, and an edited collection coming out about gendered phenomenology and race, phenomenology of race. These disciplines are growing more and more with the rise that you mentioned at the start. Any other questions at this point? Yeah, um, um, I'm currently at the Royal Social School of um, Oxford Shizana, and at the moment um, I'm working on, on an installation where I'm trying to, I'm trying to create my own phenomenological world as we're like, in terms of like Merle Pointy, so I am of it in the world. And um, I have autism, so what I'm trying to do in the installation is trying to help the other be, um, understand what it is to be in my own phenomenological world. And so I'm, the problem we're having in the studio is if I am of my own phenomenological experience and I have my own horizon of, of significance, and the other then comes into the to the studio. Where I mean, how there's a clash because they've got their own phenomenological world too. So then, how how can I how how does one create a bridge between the two different phenomenological experiences? You know, so that's what I'm stuck with at the moment. Um, and I don't I don't know if you had any maybe like suggestions. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a lot of like. Studying around like Murray Pointy um, and his, you know, and his studies of, you know, of body and uh, so yeah. So um, hermeneutic phenomenology. Gardamer writes specifically about the fusion of horizons. The fusion of horizons, yeah. 
okay? And, uh, and that's what happens when we meet a different tradition. That's what happens when we meet a person, another person. You have this fusion of interpretive horizons that happens. And, the, and even my own horizon, as I make the world, the world is alien to me fundamentally. I've just arrived here. I'm driving a car in England for the first time and you've got these massive roundabouts with these lanes and you have to know these numbers and which one you come into. This is an alien world to me. And I've, I know how to drive, I know how to operate a car, I've got this sense. My horizon of being in the world as a driver operating a car um, determined by the roads, I'm meeting another horizon that you all understand implicitly. And you know where to go in these lanes, and I don't. So I'm meeting with this alien world horizon and becoming something else through the interpretation. So Gardamer is really good for that. It's in Truth and Method, in his book Truth and Method. And um, also uh, an essay by um, Recur, yeah. by Paul Recur, in the book From Text to Action. I can't remember the name of the essay, but it's on page 88. <laughs> He talks about making the world in front of the audience, is what he talks about. Yeah. And partly by way of, of tying that question together with the, the question about responses to and perhaps integrations of phenomenology with other systems of thinking, uh, leaping back to the postmodern, Baudrillard talks about uh, some of that with respect to the subjectivity of objects, right? The way in which we, we need to restore to objects their own subjectivity. And to me, that, although he's more grounded in a postmodern tradition, that has always been a kind of phenomenological approach to things. That relationship Stuart was talking about earlier is really all about what's happening in between. It's, it, you know, it, it's saying it's not about the subject, it's not about the object. Those were the, the, that was the binary, we would dissolve that binary, we think about the the, 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 that requires having the, what I think of as the object, having the cop, to go back to that, imbued with its sort of uh, ability to turn the tables, as it, as it were, and be the subject. Yeah, but, but can't we necessarily assume that the other is there when they come in and think, oh, well, you know, this, this is absolutely. the process. Absolutely. Uh, 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 mm. No, that's absolutely right. But I think that you know, one of the ways, and it's probably very loose, and Stuart might actually, you know, after this, slap me on the side of the head for, for, for this, uh, as it might not be terribly rigorous. But one of the ways in which I often think about uh, this is that the sense of, uh, of phenomenology being a practice or an attempt to let an object of study appear to me as itself. Right, okay, to, uh, to, to greet it on its own terms, yes. uh, uh, as it were, um, which, as I say, is maybe, maybe a bit woolly <laughs> in, in that sense. But, but coming back to, to, you know, the sense that you mentioned earlier, Stuart, about uh, it's, it's bloody hard to become a phenomenologist and to do this stuff. It, takes, it sort of takes a kind of, you know, training and consistency and a rigor. You can say, yes, meet it on its own terms, but then to, to sort of continuously try to do that. And that is part of some of the methodologies inherent in phenomenology, the reduction, the bracketing, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and in that, just as, as well as that, I'd look at Husserl's fifth Cartesian meditation, where he talks about the impossibility of knowing the other. Mm. And... Um, uh, and that was a big impetus to Levinas and Levinas's idea that when you look into the face of the other you see the infinite because mm. it's completely unknowable and that we invented the infinite by looking into the face of the other mm. um, and that I think stems from Cartesian meditation number five mm. so um, but that's all about the fact that we just don't know even your autistic world might be very different from my in some other way mentally your world um, uh, and they might be more different, and mine and Matt's world might supposedly, putatively, be of lesser difference, but I don't think they are. I think that bedrock of fundamental unknowability um, is what we always get down to once you strip away the, the common cultural or whatever the linguistic things. So therefore, phenomenology is not really, it comes down to it's not possible. If it always comes down to this unknown, then you can never truly understand anyone's phenomenology. Uh, Heidegger Gert dealt with that best of everybody, I think, with his idea of the abgrund, the unground, that um, somehow we've got to come to terms with the fact that everything comes from nothing. Uh, 
I don't think. I'm not sure. I can't recall. It's been a long time since I read Truth and Method. When I think of stuff that questions the idea of subject and object, I don't immediately go to Gadamer. Um, I would go to Dufresne or something like that. But from what I know of Gadamer, um, uh, and from what I remember of Gadamer, it does, it's more intersubjective. And uh, when you're encountering the work of the other author of, that you're translating, um, you're dealing with that subjectivity. But equally, that subjectivity is just one emergence on the whole cultural horizon of which it is a, an expression in that kind of... Um, Yeah, and uh, I think anybody who tries to stage Shakespeare is always doing that. Yeah. I'm conscious of the time. Should we press on? Yeah, and, sure. and I think I'm um, conscious of the fact that we're probably much later on than I had uh, imagined. So if it's all right, uh, we'll probably go maybe to about half past between our two okay. presentations. Well, let's uh, just get a little little bit. You want to uh, kick off then? Yep, sure. Yeah, okay. okay um, Need that uh, here. Uh, not yeah, just get rid of that. Yeah. I'm a site and specific. You're just down there actually already. Okay. All right, got it. This is just a bunch of pretty pictures. <laughs> um, when Matt said, oh, do you want to use a PowerPoint? I said, I don't use PowerPoints. PowerPoints are for selling real estate. And I, just a note, pedagogical moment. I actually think the PowerPoints used in classes are designed to stop students thinking. Um, but, so, but then, I thought, geez, maybe we are selling real estate. <laughs> We're trying to sell phenomenology as real estate. But then I thought, nah, I'll just make some nice pictures. I'm a site-specific performer, and this is just a selection that is of a bunch of photos from the most recent performance by my group, the Environmental Performance Authority. We work around critical sites, not so far all to do with water. Um, we do buto and body weather, mostly body weather, which is, anybody know about body weather? Uh, it's a, it's a buto based environmental sp performance art form. And it was invented by a guy called Min Tanaka. And Min said, when I dance, I don't dance in the place, but I am the place. So as a phenomenologist, this has really exciting ramifications for me. It's a profoundly ontological statement, I am the place. So the methodology of body weather is to be the place or to have a fundamental ontological relationship with the place. The paper that I'm about to present uh, is from a larger piece of writing uh, adapted from a larger piece of writing which is about our methodology and I specifically in the larger piece of writing, I talk about a couple of p techniques that we use. One called bag of bones, which I did with uh, some students here on Monday and they loved it. Was it good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, the idea of bag of bones is giving over to, you get moved by other people. And the whole approach of body weather is that you want to be moved by the place. The source of your work comes from the place. You are the vehicle of the place. You are moved by the place and you give over to the place. And there are hundreds and thousands probably of techniques and type, different types of image work that you use to put your body subservient to the place. And this is um, how I developed a method of a, an interpretation and a set of further developments of our performance method from Heidegger. But I'm particularly now talking about the later Heidegger. Um, the Contributions to Philosophy, which I'm talking about, is a book that, not a book, it wasn't even a book. In, in, uh, I'll give you just a really brief philosophical background. Heidegger wrote Being and Time, and he said, oh my God, I've failed. All I've been able to do is circumscribe the limits of metaphysics. I haven't gone beyond metaphysics. He said, here's me bagging out Nietzsche because Nietzsche never got beyond metaphysics and I've made the same mistake. I have to figure a way out of metaphysics so that I can really do being 
and between 1936 and 1942, Heidegger wrote thousands and thousands of pages of performative writing, which he said are not to be published in his lifetime. They only started getting published in the 1990s, they're still being released. Um, and uh, the most significant one is called Contributions to Philosophy. And on the very early pages of that, he says in Austinian mode in 1936, this writing is a saying. It is, a, it is not about what it says, it is what it says. It is the actual coming forth of what it says. So at the moment, the bulk of my work is on this history of a kind of performative imperative in Heidegger's work. Heidegger invented performativity. Um, and uh, we're only just finding this out because the work that he did it in is only just being published. Anyway, Heidegger introduced hermeneutics to the phenomenological tradition, superseding Husserl's obdurate Cartesian quest for apodictic certainty with a non a prioristic perspectivism. The fundamental thought of hermeneutics is the hermeneutic circle. Set into motion by Schleiermacher in 1805 through his insight into the co-constitution of self and language. An act of speaking, this is a quote from Schleiermacher, 1805, an act of speaking cannot even be understood as a moment in a person's development unless it is also understood in relation to the language. This is because the linguistic heritage modifies our mind. Nor can an act of speaking be understood as a modification of the language unless it is also understood as a moment in the development of the person. Because an individual is able to influence a language by speaking, which is how a language develops. Heidegger's work can be read in one sense as an ever more fundamental radicalisation of this structure of mutual co-determination, reaching its most complete expression in his later idea of the turning. The persistent impulse in this aspect of Heidegger's work is the attempt to escape oppositions between being and beings, world and earth, human and world, truth as correspondence and correctness, and the intentional relation between perceiver and perceived. Heidegger refigures all of these apparent oppositions as relationships of mutual co-requirement. The turning is a refiguring of the question of the relationship of the human to its environments. In the turning, the human is considered as an emergence that occurs with the environment it inhabits. The things of the world are not conceived as out there, as objects held over against I, the subject, but are inextricably involved in belonging with me as co-immersion. Rather than a subject which has others, human and non-human, as objects represented in systems, the turning frames the human as situated in and determined by its others in a mutually creative oscillation or counter-resonance, which brings forth both, both as emergences of the same process, a, a process Heidegger calls being with a Y. Being with a Y is not a quality which beings possess, as in the beingness of beings, but the process which occurs when the interpretive throwing projection of human Dasein opens the worlds to which it belongs and without which it could not exist. Human Dasein and being require each other in a mutual belonging. The human is no longer the representing spectator of the world arrayed before it, but is intrinsically implicated in it. The human is responsible for the unconcealing disclosure of the world, for bringing it to light. The things of the world are unconcealed as what they are by the human engagement with them. For Heidegger, this disclosure is the site of truth. The everyday contemporary idea of truth as correctness and correspondence is a later historical development according to Heidegger, which diverges from a more fundamental idea of truth as the uncovering bringing forth of what is as what it is. Heidegger retrieves this sense of truth from the Greek idea aletheia, unforgetting. Truth is the process by which the unconcealment of what is fundamentally occurs. In the origin of the work of art, Heidegger describes this fundamental occurrence of the coming forth of truth as the strife between earth and world. The strife between earth and world is an exemplary instance of this mutual co-belonging. 
world and earth are essentially different from one another, this is Heidegger now, quote, world and earth are essentially different from one another and yet are never separated. The world grounds itself on the earth and earth juts through world. Yet the relationship between world and earth does not wither away into the empty unity of opposites unconcerned with one another. The world, in resting upon the earth, strives to surmount it. As self-opening, it cannot endure anything closed. The earth, however, as sheltering and concealing, tends always to draw the world into itself and keep it there." Unquote. So earth and world, like Dasein and being, require each other. The earth, again quote, the earth cannot dispense with the open region of the world. The world in turn cannot soar out of the earth's sight. The world sets itself up on earth and earth juts through the world. This strife of earth and world is the occurrence of the movement of clearing and concealing, which Heidegger calls truth. One key site where truth happens in Heidegger is the work of art. In Heideggerian terms, the performance aim of the Environmental Performance Authority is to enjoin the strife between earth and world, to set up a clearing and in so doing allow earth to be unconcealed in its concealedness. The performer's work with the sheltered concealment of earth, never fully understanding and encompassing it, but nevertheless aiming to set up worlds as hermeneutic clearings, interpretations which others, audience members, can then experience. However, ultimately, in the experience of those worlds, the audience members are confronted with the impenetrability of earth as it juts through those worlds. Earth is never revealed naked and indiscreet, but only shows forth shrouded in and as its mystery and hiddenness. Quote again, the gravity of stone, the mute hardness of wood, the dark glow of colours. All the performance can do is set up hermeneutic worlds in which performers and audience reserve and preserve the shelteredness of earth. There is no offering of the all revealing mystery of understanding, but rather, an invitation to enjoin the strife. So, in and from the immersion of the turning, through techniques which I've described elsewhere as the giving over to and the being moved by, the performers make the decisions through which worlds are set up and the concealedness of earth juts forth. The performance method aims to enact the oscillating counter resonance of the performers and the place. This fundamentally occurs as the setting up of a world. The world of the performance offers no comprehension of the earth but becomes its vehicle. The performative entry into the turning becomes the site where truth occurs as the counter resonance or oscillation of the strife of earth and world. The performance is a place where truth as unconcealing happens. As performative, the performance is not about the place in the same way that Heidegger's writings in the contributions to philosophy are not about anything but are sayings which bring forth that which they say. As performative, the performance enacts the place, is of the place, emerges from the place as the instancing, instauration of the place, the setting up of a world. The performance strives towards the non-mimetic, the non-narrative, through the being moved by and carries the being moved by into the audience to allow them to be moved by the performance into the place. In this Heideggerian sense, the body weather methodology of the EPA constitutes a projecting open of a world which opens a way into the place for the audience. It does not tell stories, does not imitate the place, but opens it as the place that it is through allowing it to emerge as truth in the oscillating counter resonance of the strife of earth and world. There is certainly a great deal of prior research that goes into the performance, into the indigenous and non-indigenous stories and histories, the knowledge of the flora and fauna, the migratory birds, the geology, and some of it finds its way into the performance as content. But primarily, the role of the research is to sensitise the performers to the nuances and subtleties of the qualities of the place, to soften them, 
so that the throne projecting open of the being moved by and the giving over to, to the winds, to the temperatures, the forms, the textures, the swampiness, the smells, the densities, the intensities, the aridity, the porosities, can allow the bodies of the performers to be the carriers of the resonances of the place and to carry forth those resonances as counter resonances opened for the audience to attune to the worlds which the performance method sets up for the sheltering of the emer earth to emerge in its hiddenness. In discussions during and after the performance, both audience members and performers commented on how aspects of the work which caught the slowness and stillness of the place, movements which harmonised with the intrinsic rhythms, were more affecting than faster or more overtly danced in positions. Also, the more the movements directly resembled the movements of the place and the things in it, the river, the trees, etc., the more theatrical and representational it became. The more it set the audience up in an inframed spectatorial mode. And the less it felt as though it was opening up the place for the audience. Audiences felt drawn into the place by slower movements, subtle gestures and stillness. Movements which sought to recreate sensations which had occurred as a result of the encounter with the place were more affecting for the audience than more mimetic representational movements. The giving over to the place created a greater sense of belonging in a mode of listening to the place. The listening bodies of the performers drew the audiences into the rhythms and attitudes and orientations of the listening. In discussions at the end, audiences felt that the aim of the performance to draw attention to the place itself, rather than to an appreciation of the art of the performers, had been achieved. The performers became an attracting part of the texture of the place. Performers and audience agreed that it is in the reservedness, the stillness, the silence, the listening, the slowness, the holding back, that the performance allows the place to show itself as it is. The overt performance of the stillness and silence invites the audience into the fundamental attunement of reservedness, allowing them to use the performance to enter into the place in a way to which normal everyday modes, strolling, walking the dog, thinking of the affairs of the daily business, even in the most relaxed mode, cannot attain. The attunement of reservedness or restraint Heidegger calls Verhaltenheit, in its stillness and silence, is central to Heidegger's preparation for the performative leap into the inceptual thinking which would escape representational metaphysics. Reservedness, silence and stillness are all intimately tied up with the truth of the disclosure of the world and the concealedness of earth. Quote again, thus the deep stillness must first come over the world for the earth. This stillness only springs forth from reticence, keeping silent. And this reticence, bringing into silence, only grows out of reservedness. As grounding achievement, attunement, reservedness thoroughly tunes the intimacy of the strife between world and earth, and thus the strifing of the onset of enonement. Enonement is a Heideggerian term meaning coming into its own as what it is. Moreover, he says, reservedness is the ground of care. Reservedness of Dasein first of all grounds care as the inner biting that sustains the there. This suggests that reservedness and restraint are also necessary conditions of the coming forth of place as it occurs in the projecting open. In the contributions, the concept of Dasein from being and time as a kind of essence of human being undergoes a transformation to become the action of the opening of time space, the condition of possibility of time and space. This time space occurs through the throne projecting open of human understanding, again a development from being and time. But in the contributions, it sustains an emergence into a there through the staying with of in abiding care. But this inabiding care requires reservedness as its ground. So it would seem that a performance sufficient to allow the place itself to emerge must be grounded in restraint and reservedness. Clearly, there is much to be unravelled here. 
I'm speaking a dense Heideggerian language, rife with neologisms, translations, retranslations, unconventional usages and philologically derived redefinitions. Heideggerian terms such as care, strife, projecting open, earth, world, truth and many others here require thorough, thorough introductory definition for the performance studies scholar. To cite a random example, the word for restraint itself, Verhaltenheit, contains echoes of holding, withholding, holding open, stopping and staying. Daniela Villaganoi writes of, quote, a staying with speechlessness, a staying turned towards the occurrence of being, attuned by reservedness, listening to being's compelling call, that Heidegger will rethink in his later works as das Galaut der Stille, the gathered sounding of silence. The necessity of this renovation of language is crucial to Heidegger's project. He is seeking a way out of Western metaphysics to establish a completely new relationship with being and consequently with the ways in which humans manifest the world for themselves. On account of his principle that language is the way the relationship with the world is revealed, a new language is required to unconceal the world anew. Accordingly, in the contributions, Heidegger embarks on a series of performative writing experiments to attempt this leap into a new thinking. The Contributions proposes a performative solution to the problem of metaphysics, decided precisely because it escapes existent language and listens to find the new language appropriate to coming forth and realisation. In the case of the performance methodology referred to here, it needs to be stressed that the application of Heidegger's thinking is not a blunt after the fact analogising interpretation of the work, looking to find parallels, but it's a concrete starting point a formative inspiration and inception for the development of the method. Heidegger's performative new thinking provides an example of fundamental principles and approaches which might animate a performance methodology by which a new relation between the earth and the human might be ventured. The performance work, although derived from a specific tradition of Bhutan and body weather, is a direct application of Heidegger's thinking. It is so because the thinking of the turning as an attempt and an entirely new conceptualization of the relationship between humans and their worlds offers a way to an echo phenomenological performance based in such a relationship. This mode of performance in its aim to show the place rather than the performers is an embodied instantiation of a thinking in which the human is no longer the star of the show but catches attention, stands aside and draws the audience into a dwelling with the place. Finally, the ultimate exigency which unites both Heidegger's performative writings and the work of the EPA is a sense of the emergency which necessitates this work, Heidegger. Therein is decided the future of humans. They may for centuries still ravish and devastate the planet with their machinations and the monstrousness of this drive may develop to an inconceivable extent assume the form of an apparent strictness and become the measuring regulation of the devastated as such. The greatness of being will remain closed off since decisions about truth and untruth no longer arise. All that matters is the calculation of the success and failure of the machinations. This calculation extends into a presumed eternity, which is not such, but is only the endless and so on of what is most desolate and most fleeting. Ah. The stakes are high. <laughs> the future of humanity, the future of the earth, the future of science and the relationship with the divine. In the face of such high stakes, prudent restraint allows only the acknowledgement that a still forming evanescent relationship between some philosophical concepts and a site specific performance technique can merely hint or point towards a little more than a beginning recognition of the potential that this period of Heidegger's work has for devising a proposed mode of site-specific ecological performance which aims to create the possibility of a new kind of thinking and acting based in a relation of giving over to being moved by the environment. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> God. Yeah. Is it useful to take questions on that now or to, to, to wait? I was thinking the uh, break we took a couple minutes ago was probably useful actually. Uh, so maybe uh, while that's, that, that's fresh, we'll open that up to just five minutes of 
discussion, if you like. And then my, what I've got for you is a bit more informal, so we'll move on and end with that. But does anyone have questions or responses uh, for Stuart? Yeah. Um, does your work Does, you know, does the earth, does the environment, is that a construct of narrative or do you more work towards post traumatic dramaturgy where they're, even though it's in and of the earth, it's more of a deconstructionist way of meaning? Because I, I noticed the post traumatic hijinks mentioned quite a lot mm. uh, by Lehman, so I was just wondering what's, what's your work set? I guess in those terms, which I would never use, the, the distinction between narrative and post-dramatic, I would never use when talking about the work. But in, in those terms, it's definitely much more towards the post-dramatic. But you cannot escape narrative. These are walking performances. We take a group of people through a bunch of environments where a whole lot of performative installations occur. The mere fact that you're going through over a period of time you're creating a narrative and that audience is continually looking for meaning and continually creating narratives in their heads. And, and we also find that as we're doing this, we go, oh, that's sort of like what we did earlier. There's a connection there and we might develop that connection. So in a very sort of loose sense of narrative as flow of events sequentially, it's inevitable. But um, mostly our decisions are based on colour and temperature and... Um, uh, there's a sense you get when you're doing this work. It's all based on images. You take up images into the body and somehow you get to a point where it just feels right. And where we're standing as a group watching each other working and we go, yes. And we don't really examine that yes as to why it's a yes. We join in and we take up that yes and we, get, and we develop it from there. Um, and uh, some, quite often it might be something that makes us laugh. It might be something that just, with a colour, that those pink wigs came from those little pink flowers. And, and when we put the pink wigs on in the environment, silly pink plastic wigs in this pristine... Some of those plants are 200 years old, but they're only that big, and if you touch them, they die. Um, uh, it seemed right to put on pink wigs in there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that answers your question. It's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really interesting. It's quite dense, as you, as you quite rightly put. Um, but there seems to be a, a, a real essence of uh, facilitation for the audience, where you, what, what you as performers, and actually in the, in the very structure of what you're doing, is to facilitate what you're trying to put across, which is the environment, mm. through through performance methods, however that might be. But it's like completely, or, or as close to, completely devoid of ego. So what you're trying to do is strip away that ego in order to facilitate the process of engaging with the environment. And in doing so, you're, you're kind of taking on that role of the environment within yourself. Is that what I it's what Matt talked about before I started talking about letting the thing be what it is. Mm. That's the phenomenological impulse of this performance is why it's echo phenomenological performance mm -hmm. is it's attempting to let the place be what it is. And so if people are looking at us and going, wow, you guys are great, then we've failed. Mm -hmm. If people are going and going, wow, look at this place. God, feel this environment, mm -hmm. this atmosphere. The work's called the Dictionary of Atmospheres mm -hmm. is kind of the method, the overall method. And, uh, and so the best thing we can do is get out of the way. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like a way wu way. Mm -hmm. um, you, you act by not acting. And, and so we go in, do the performance in order to not be the object of the performance. The, the same could be said for within, within any, any form of theatre. If, if, the, if the idea is to, is to facilitate the telling of the story, then there is no star of a story apart from the story. So just get out and just, tell, just present that and be a conduit. Mm. You know, every actor on stage, the scenery, absolutely everything is simply to be a conduit for the story to be able to, mm. 
the defense codes. David Mamet would have it that way. Yeah. Yes, in certain conventions <laughs> of theater, I would yeah. say that's, uh, that's yeah. the case. I was mind. I, I think that's true, and I was mindful of what you're saying. There's something very Artodian about what you're talking about. You know, uh, let space speak. Right, right. Let the, the 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 job of the theater is to animate space. It's not to not to tell the story, not to be a conduit for anything, but to animate the uh, the space itself. So, uh, but but I suppose what I would uh, the connection I would make there is yes, that there is a sense of again trying to to come back to Stuart's very opening, trying to get at the fundamental essence of what any particular thing is. So a piece of theater by David Mamet, what is that? How does it appear to me? I can't turn it into something post-colonial, for example. You, you, how, 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 how can I get at what it is? What is this kind of performance? What is it? And, and I think that that that's what ties together a lot of, uh, of the work, and that's for me a lot of the value in a phenomenological approach to, to something. To, to it, though it might be impossible to come back to an earlier comment, uh, to fully bracket away everything, y you know, a complete reduction might be a bridge too far. Uh, though that might be the case, there is that still is the value of the approach. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Another Artodian thing about the work is the body where the performer is a fine nerve meter. Is it what? Sorry? A fine nerve meter. That the uh, Artos assertion that the, the actor should be a fine nerve meter, mm. that uh, you work so much on disorganising the, um, the hierarchy of your senses and you become so attuned and you do so much work with speeds and slownesses and intense attention and, uh, um, and dwelling and staying with for time that you become so acutely sensitised. If I go away for a body weather workshop for like 10 days and a body weather day is like a 12 hour day of this brutal perceptual violence um, and I come back and I stand in my neighbourhood and everything just goes in the city that I just, I can, nearly can't breathe. It, you, your senses get so heightened like a cat on acid. <laughs> yeah. I have a slightly naive question, but um, because it's, it's uh, with your photos, it's the implication of being in nature, being in a natural environment, and yet this idea of um, you know, can it be done in this room? Can we do, or does it need to be with earth, with water, not just for EPA, but in what you're putting across? Well, there's two things that you might mean there. Um, do you mean, can we do a placial analysis of this room? And could I take you all through a bunch of body weather exercises where you would be hearing that hum like it was howling in your head and you wanted to run out of the room? I could. And, uh, and could we be, be able to detect the smells and the way they differ in that corner and this corner and, and the way that that light is on the back wall there compared to the darkness here in this corner and, uh, and that we could find the fast places in the room in the slope. We could do that. And so we could do an intense placial analysis of this room and we could, uh, what we would also do if we were doing this is we'd be eventually talking about the democratisation of the university in the 1960s and um, <laughs> what sort of a place Surrey was in the Middle Ages. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I guess I was interested in the way it shifts into if you're in a technologically hyperspace, that it becomes a kind of a negative, or, or you know, what becomes that absorption of us as performers, let's say, versus if we're in a space of, of grass and, and, you know, I, I was yeah. curious. If, this, this environment we're working in is right next to a big oil refinery. The reason that this prime real estate within 10 kilometres of a city which is real estate mad, Melbourne is the second most expensive real estate in the world, which is really weird for a place that's got such a big country as Australia. This is 10 kilometres from the centre of the city and yet it hasn't been developed for real estate because there's a bloody great oil refinery there. But what the oil refinery has done is by stopping that residential development, there's all of these estuaries that have these ancient migratory bird nesting places and these plants that have been there for hundreds of years that are in their original state. The, the technology, the relationship between the technology and the people 
the, the arrival of the white people and, and everything that was there before has kind of preserved this environment in this strange way. That's just one example of the way in which you're always in this work as a human, um, in a sense, an intruder, but an intruder that's coming from within. And according to Heidegger, we can never escape. As contemporary Western people, we can never escape our technological inframing. We are so imbued with ideas of use and worth and value that we can't come to it denuded of that. So if we're doing it in a warehouse, and we do lots of work in warehouses and things like that, and uh, we've done one in a cathedral, um, the process is similar. Um, of course, the images are all different. Um, the, the tenor and the quality of the work is different. But it still seems that the stuff that really works is the stuff that stops and listens and waits for the place to emerge. I think there's one there and then Patrick, yeah. Yeah, um, just a quick one. Um, I'm going to assume that John Cage um, <laughs> influences you maybe in some of your in your site specific work on nature and two, do you ever consider the ontology of the aesthetic when you're making your site specific work and how that narrative might influence what you're saying? John Cage only influences me to the extent that I'm a musician and he's the most important composer of the 20th century. Um, okay. <laughs> um, and what was the other half about the, <laughs> the ontology of the aesthetic? The ontology of the aesthetic. Yeah. But also on, on the Cage front, apart from the facetious answer, uh, it's all about found objects. It's all that Duchampian tradition of the American avant-garde and stuff, of course. It, it's, uh, Tester Quincy, who I learned body weather from and who everybody in my company learned body weather from, is a, um, uh, very much a disciple of, um, uh, of that Cajun and American tradition. And, um, uh, the aesthetics, the ontology the of aesthetics. Of the aesthetic, sorry, Pacific. So I, I, um, I believe that Dell's talks about the ontology within performance studies and about, you know, for example, if I see performance, I see, I see an actor and he's doing I don't know, a piece of Shakespeare, for example, within that performance, if I could, I could also understand all the other, like, the aesthetics of the space I'm watching films in speaks to and can shape how I perceive that narrative of that Shakespeare monologue, for example. There's always an ontology, there's always a haunting of performance of a narrative which has always gone before. So therefore, like, um, I was doing a research task with the scenography students and we were exploring, well, if we, you know, if they, were, if they want to do a site-specific space in a cathedral, for example, and they've got their own unique narrative, but then the cathedral speaks of different narratives and different um, aesthetics, and that, inf and that could or could not influence that. So do you, would you consider the ontology, like Derrida's ontology of what came before. Oh, the ontology. Yeah, yeah, got, got it. Yeah, sorry, it's the accent got me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we do our historical research. Yeah. Um, we did one, a, a month-long installation in a Alice Springs in a deserted sheep station. And by the end of it, we were just, there were ghosts everywhere in these houses. We knew the people that lived. We looked at the, who bought the station and who sold it to who and who raped who in this station and how the Aborigines got killed on this station. And we did all that work. And by the time, and the, the windmill that we found in the stories that was broken and tipped over, um, one of us came up with a term that Everything there was a pathetic remnant um, of that just this, this bearer of feeling of, of the history of the place. And so, so yeah, of course, yeah. And, and here, the, what haunts this site is the Aboriginal stories of this site have gone. It's, it's haunted by this absence. We talk to the Aboriginal elders who supposedly come from this clan, which is the Dungwadden clan, and um, say, so what happened to the people there? And they just make jokes about it. They don't know. They just say, oh, mate, they all turned white. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Patrick? Um, non 
relatively grounded question. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, and I suppose it's in light of what you just said about the, the politics of the work that you're making, so beyond the phenomenological uh, experience of it and the, the methodology of it and the way in which you're trying to make the <coughs> space, particularly the one you're looking at, be the experience for the audience, not the stars, of, not, not the humans as the stars of the show. But there is something human about this work, particularly as you've just narrated it. There is something deeply politicized about it. I just wondered if you could talk mm. about that. The, um, I work in a university. It's part, of <laughs> <laughs> it's part of my job that I have to apply for funding. It's part of my job that I have to explore new funding streams. Um, what we call category two and three funding streams. Um, after a couple of years on the job, I thought, oh God, I'm not going to get one of these big ARC half a million dollar grants for talking about Heidegger and performance, am I? <laughs> um, what do I do that's most likely to be funded? What fits with the university's research priorities? And I thought, oh, well, I do body weather. And, um, and I've been thinking about body weather in Melbourne, blah, blah, because I started doing this work with these people because I was brought up in Melbourne, but I went away from Melbourne for 30 years and I came back to it to take up this job. And it was the same but different. And, uh, and it was my body weather training that gave me this really intense experience of all these differences and samenesses about the place. So for instance, the one that I always turn to is, I stood, and only Melbourneite would understand this, I stood facing west at four o'clock in the afternoon. The light was pink gray. I was facing west. My left cheek was freezing cold. It was autumn, it was autumn. My left cheek was freezing cold. My right cheek was getting sunburnt. And, uh, and this pink gray light was, was fading. And I thought, oh my God, I've lived in so many places in the world, I have never experienced this little microclimate. And it was my body weather training that tuned me in to that little microclimate. And I recognized that the direction of the wind was from the southeast. There was a certain amount of moisture in the air, a certain air pressure. And that colour, that temperature, that air pressure, that movement of the air, I thought, fuck, this is fucking Melbourne. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> How did I get back here? I said I was never coming back. But I thought, no, I've got to really explore this, this thing. And so that's when I started doing the work. And then I thought, okay, but this is the politics of the thing. Um, I decided I was most likely to get funding to do this work than any other part of my work. So I pursued it. And... Um, then I started talking to people about the, in the councils because I thought, ah, oh, category two and three funding. I'll get funding from councils from their little grants and I'll make partnerships with them and then I'll put together a big linkage research grant and then I'll get three quarters of a million dollars off the government to, to do body weather. Um, that's the brutal cynical politics of it, okay, is that it's about institutional requirements of my job. Um, that's one side of it. The other side of it is what Heidegger said. I think we're in trouble. <laughs> I think we're in really, really, really big trouble on this planet. And, um, and even though everybody in this room is probably, uh, would agree with me on that, the significant proportions of the people who have the power don't agree with that and don't really care about that. And um, so I think that uh, um, then it comes down to a question of, okay, how does this do any good? And my wife, who's a very practical, down-to-earth Chinese woman, said, can you explain to me how you and all your Bhutto friends, you put on your white face paint and you go and you wobble around next to bits of water, how exactly does this be good for the world? <laughs> and, um, and I thought, hmm, good question. <laughs> and so a big part of the exploration has become what can performance do? What can art do? There's the journal, Public Art, and all it is is hagiographies of people saying, I do this and I do that. There's very little research into actually what happens in public performance that makes the world a better place. And, um, and so I've started to do that, and that's led me to questions of the aesthetics of, uh, 
uh, to, to the notion of aesthetic experience. And what we've found is that by taking people into these places and providing them with this real intense experience of the place, that we've had it things like we did one on a little river and we took around a whole lot of residents who'd lived there for years and years and they all came out going, oh, these are just ordinary suburban people. I've never seen this place like this. I'm never going to think of this again in the same way. And I thought, okay, there's something here in the way in which the performance can be contrived to make the intensity of the experience and to give the performance over to the creation of that experience for the audience rather than, hey, look at us. Haven't we been doing body weather for a long time? Um, uh, and so that to me is another political dimension of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think move I on. Could, oh, yeah, I think, uh, thank you for that, Stuart. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief, I think. Um, <clears throat> we had conceived all of uh, this today, as I said, kind of in, in four parts by way of saying, well, we'll lay down some groundwork, we'll talk about some key concepts, uh, and then we'll give maybe two examples of how one might take those concepts and apply them uh, to specific instances of performance or to specific uh, performance or theatrical conventions. What Stuart has uh, done, of course, was take uh, some very specific uh, Heideggerian concepts and uh, talk it through vis-a-vis -a, -vis a single performance, a particular site-specific performance. What I had in mind was to suggest that you, one can take everything we've been talking about uh, and work through what I think of as a kind of broad-based phenomenology. Uh, that is to say, in a way, everything that we have uh, talked about uh, thus far, and think through a convention, an author, a performance uh, from a, a much broader spectrum. And that's the work that I've been engaged in uh, lately. I'm developing a book project on Shakespearean phenomenology, which is, as I just said, kind of intended to be a broad-based phenomenology. How does Shakespearean theater appear to us? What is it? What is the thing in front of uh, me? Right? It's a big and ambitious question, right? And there's obviously there's no end of scholarship already on Shakespearean theatre. So what might that contribute? Well, I'll, I'll give an overview of the way that I'm thinking through the project. It's not a set paper and I'm not working through uh, any kind of the detail that Stuart had. Uh, but I think maybe we can talk through that uh, afterwards if you want. But I thought I'd give an overview of the, the, uh, the way I'm thinking through this project and then just see where that takes us. Right? So <coughs> the project is uh, on the phenomenology of Shakespearean theatre. Um, it's uh, uh, a book uh, which is underpinned by a couple of key concerns, uh, most notably some we've talked about already, uh, particularly in terms of the sense of encounter. Right? And so what we were talking about earlier, the relationship between subject and object, uh, how can I approach something like Shakespearean theatre and allow it to be itself? Is that even possible with something like Shakespeare? The short answer is probably not, <laughs> at least not uh, fully. But as I said earlier, how can I maybe move in that direction? How, how might one perhaps move in that direction? I'm also always, as we've raised a couple of times, very interested in this notion of uh, reduction and reduction down towards a sense of fundamental elements of what makes up a thing, in this case, Shakespearean theater. Right? So what are the things that make up Shakespearean theater. And that gave rise to the title of my book project, which is called The Play and the Thing. And its premise is that, like most things, Shakespeare, Shakespearean theater is made up of a series of things. And you can actually say, OK, there are a set number of these. They might be variable. One might not be able to pin it down exactly. But it's also not an infinite number of components. And you can't say everything is a, a, a fundamental, irreducible part of Shakespearean theatre. What are these things? Well, I, I would argue there's about six, seven, maybe eight of them, and the book that I'm working on will concentrate on five of them. Bodies, spaces, language or text, audiences, and technologies. Okay. That kind of thinking, by the way, is present in a lot of the work uh, that I do. It's 
present partly in the work that Stuart and I are doing on phenomenology and performance in general and the edited collection we're putting together. It's present partly in the work that Stuart Andrews and I are doing on uh, the door, uh, the way that I approach that, uh, how do we understand the door in relationship to those things, and it's present, of course, in the way that I think through uh, theater, and as uh, students in the room uh, here might know, it's present in some of the way that I uh, teach as well. Right? So that underpins much of the, the whole project. <coughs> The book works towards the phenomenology of Shakespearean theater. In, in it, I consider in broad terms the relationship between phenomenology and Shakespearean scholarship, and I try to account for or offer an overview of this relationship and make the case for phenomenology as a potent critical tool in the study of stagecraft, especially Shakespearean stagecraft. And two basic principles, as I said, really kind of uh, underpin this. The notion of uh, reduction, Right? Uh, and an attentiveness also, in a, uh, this, that, that's by way of getting at those elements, and an attentiveness to perception or how the world appears to us. And these are two crucial ideas in phenomenology as well that we've been uh, kicking about here. Right? Adopting those as kind of a methodological basis for analysis, what I want to argue is that Shakespearean theater is productively understood in terms of these elemental things of its composition, bodies, words, spaces, props, and technologies. Are those the only five? Probably not. In fact, I would say certainly not. Uh, I think you could very easily throw in one or two more. In fact, I have done uh, the book that Laura mentioned earlier on time. I would say time is a fundamental element of Shakespearean theater. And you'll hear in some of what I'm saying here uh, in answer to Laura's earlier question about how phenomenology perhaps responds to critiques of essentialism. And from my point of view, there's, th th there's a kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, a virtue in being uh, unapologetic in some ways about that. I would put forward and do put forward that there are fundamental elements and that you can say this and that there's an argument to be made for that. Right? Um, I think time is one of those, and it's not in the book because I've done it already. I think uh, audiences is uh, one of those, and it's not in the book partly because uh, there are about three or four different studies of Shakespearean audiences uh, in the past three or four years, so, and also because you can only have a book of a certain size. Um, admittedly, all of this it would be a kind of preliminary phenomenology or a work toward a phenomenology. Uh, it's not possible to cover all of these elements. It's not possible to cover all phenomenologies. Right? Uh, I, I don't do much with uh, Levinas. Right? I don't do much with uh, Marion. I don't do much with an awful lot. Right? For, of course, one uh, cannot. I tend to, as perhaps some of that overview I gave earlier tended to do, focus on Husserl, Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty. Uh, with, with some uh, extensions, but that tends to be the sort of uh, bedrock uh, of what I do. So all of this is, is not meant to be comprehensive. The other big issue is that in order to account for phenomenology of Shakespearean theater, one has to account for the cultural iconicity of Shakespeare. Right? One has to go out beyond the theater, as it were. One, one has to, to leave the stage and say, any time you say the word Hamlet or Shakespeare or see a program or go anywhere, you have Shakespeare. <laughs> you kind of kind of bear. You get, there, there's a fantastic film uh, out of the 90s, Al Pacino's Looking for Richard, which is a kind of documentary of his uh, sort of investigating how to put on a production of Richard III. There's this great moment in which, in which he walks out on stage, Pacino walks out on stage uh, in order to start delivering you know, the opening soliloquy of, of Richard III, or now the winter of our discontent. And he walks out there, and he, of course, stages all of himself, looks out in the audience, and the audience in the theater consists of one person, Shakespeare. Right? And Pacino's like, oh, fuck. Uh, and <laughs> turns out and walks back. That's the kind of weight, right, that, 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 we, that we're dealing with, right? So, so a, a phenomenology of Shakespeare, how Shakespeare appears to us, has to include that to some degree, right? Uh, but a book can't do all of that. In fact, there are books and books and books on, on that, right? My point here is that in order to address Shakespearean theater, one needs to deal with the theater, one needs to deal with this sense of cultural iconicity, one needs to deal with contemporary Shakespeare, and one needs to deal with early modern Shakespeare. Right? Okay? So that all of that is a part of our perception, all of that is a part of the appearance, the way in which Shakespeare appears. And phenomenology, by asking after appearances, by asking after how something can become itself, can help us take all that into account while admittedly saying, look, we can't focus on any one of these. I can't do a cultural material approach to Shakespeare because that only gets me in there and it only, only takes part of it. Okay. So that's, the, 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 that's sort of part of the foundation of, of the way that I'm thinking of it. 
All that said, my goal is to offer a clear idea of what a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater might look like, how it might develop, and I suggest that phenomenology of Shakespearean theater has three key features. Uh, it, it takes into account, uh, some of these uh, uh, we've heard already, but just to put them together, it takes into account the appearance of Shakespeare, and there, unfortunately, you know, one puts uh, in scare quotes, right? The appearance of Shakespeare in quotes, that is the way in which Shakespeare is presented to our perception now. And that includes all of the things that I've just uh, mentioned, the cultural iconicity, the stage, the contemporary, the early modern, text, academy, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It takes, uh, tries to account for all of that or at least acknowledge all of that. Right? So that's the first thing. Uh, picking up from what Stuart uh, said in terms of opening up phenomenology in general, a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater would then need to address itself to fundamental structures and to the elementary questions of performance, the basic essentials. That's that. What is Shakespearean theater made of? How does it make itself? What are the things that constitute it? Right, those fundamental elements I mentioned earlier. And as a logical continuation, logical in my mind uh, in any event, as a logical continuation of the, uh, that second point, a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater attempts a further reduction of those things. So if Shakespearean theater is made up of bodies, spaces, props, technologies, etc., then a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater would try to pick apart bodies, Shakespearean bodies, Shakespearean spaces, and try to reduce those down to their fundamental structures. Right? Okay. Those three things are the principles, I think, of what a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater might look like, and that is uh, really what my work right now is aiming towards. It perhaps goes without saying, additionally, maybe a fourth uh, thing, that a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater necessarily draws upon existing phenomenological approaches and paradigms, right? So it's going to use Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Husserl, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to take these. But to my mind, it's crucial that these are uh, paradigms, uh, that, that a phenomenology w of Shakespearean theater would rely on these paradigms by way of explanation and enhancement of understanding, not by way of imposition. And herein lies a paradox of phenomenology that I've always perhaps struggled with, and perhaps we can talk about afterwards, in that it, on one hand, uh, asks that we approach something and let it be itself. Uh, and on the other hand, it has a method. I mean, it, 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 phenomenology is a thing unto itself. So is the application of a method allowing a thing to be itself. Okay, so there's, there's, there's that. All of this is what a phenomenology of Shakespearean theater might look like. Okay. <coughs> the project I have in hand then, to give you a sort of quick uh, overview of the way it might unfold, the project I have in hand then would spend a couple of chapters, a couple of pages uh, tracing the broad concerns, history of phenomenology, genealogies of phenomenology, the key concepts, tracing the way in which one might approach Shakespeare as a cultural icon, might approach Shakespeare as an early modern phenomenon, how do we deal with historical phenomenology, building on Bruce Smith's work that I mentioned earlier, tracing the way in which we might uh, deal with it as a contemporary theatrical phenomenon. So laying that foundation, and then would have a detailed section on uh, bodies, a detailed section on spaces, a detailed section on props, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, so a chapter on bodies, for example, the way that uh, they're working through this, a chapter on bodies will take up Hamlet, Prince Hal, Falstaff. <coughs> we'll posit that uh, this by way of giving an example of, uh, of the application of all of this, as it were. We'll posit that uh, a phenomenological reduction of the Shakespearean body eventually arrives at the argument that uh, the body is understood and operates on the Shakespearean stage as matter. Right? physical material. Right? But if one places that then in the context of an early modern, early modern understanding of both body and matter, then one has got to understand matter as having a very specific relationship to form, right? and that they're not diametrically opposed. Right? So how one understands matter as transformative, as generative, and the body as a kind of principal matter, and the body as that which grounds us in the material world of the theater, would be an argument. What do I mean by uh, that? Falstaff is a great example. You know, Falstaff comes on stage in all of his probably costumed, fake costumed hugeness, you know, uh, and he becomes the, all the world. And because the body of Falstaff is there, everything else about that world can be real and can be material. 
you know, okay? I think this operates differently in Shakespearean theater, in early modern theater, than it operates now. I saw a production at um, uh, the Barbican recently with Anthony Shear as Falstaff, who was costumed and big and had the fake belly. And it operates, I think, in contemporary stage as more of a sign, as a carrier of meaning. Okay? We understand Falstaff as meaning largesse, as meaning grotesqueness, right? but not as grounding us in a material world of grotesqueness. And this is not a lament. I'm not I'm saying one is better than the other, but I'm trying to understand how we might uh, let what is happening appear to us. When Anthony Shear is there, something else is happening with his body and is happening with, say, Armin's body in, in Shakespeare's stage. Okay. That's the type of work that I'm doing. And I, I won't go through all of it in, in such detail. Uh, a chapter on words would uh, investigate uh, the way and the degree to which words might be counted as material things. That's an early modern premise. Early modern linguists thought the spoken word was material. Okay. How does that change the nature of what we think of? Well, Merleau-Ponty, Husserl, they talk about uh, language as both uh, uh, generative on one hand, uh, uh, potentially generative on one hand, and static, representational on the other hand. These are good frameworks, phenomenological frameworks for understanding how language might work on the Shakespearean stage. And phenomenology of Shakespearean spaces might uh, consider, would consider the, the sense of the open Elizabethan stage. What's that? How does that appear to us? And again, what happens then if that gets changed, uh, as that gets changed now in contemporary stage? I think that the open space for Shakespearean theater, for example, uh, is a space which changes fundamentally the way in which we perceive things with our senses. The relationship between seeing and hearing is different in that kind of space than it is now. Okay? So space becomes transformational in terms of our very uh, excuse me, in terms of our very perception of what is in front of us. Right? <coughs> Props, uh, yeah, the things themselves indeed, right? uh, there, there's a Heideggerian, <laughs> exactly, the Heideggerian perspective here, uh, which might understand or would seek to understand the prop as uh, a work of art, a genuine work, uh, genuine is the wrong word, as a work of art in Heideggerian terms, not a tool, not a signifier, not something to carry meaning, but in that Heideggerian sense that uh, a, a work of art is not used up in its utilitarian function. Right? What does that mean? Again, to come back to something Stuart was saying, the prop becomes a space of transformation, but most importantly, perhaps a space of unconcealing, a space where truth uh, can happen. Macbeth's daggers right, do not just tell us that this is a play about uh, murder, tyranny. They transform the space into a space of murder and tyranny. The coins uh, in Merchant of Venice, and most particularly the scales in the trial scene in Merchant of Venice, what a fantastic prop. Scales which weigh money, scales which weigh justice, scales which weigh the flesh, the pound of flesh that's going to be cut out of a human being. Okay? This is not just telling us that, oh gee, we need to think about mercy. The quality of mercy is not strained. It's not just telling us that. It's transforming the space there. Not every prop in Shakespeare does this, not all props do, but the, 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 the really important ones, the really central ones, do this. They operate as other than carriers of meaning. Okay? And finally, technologies, uh, which is perhaps the trickiest of, uh, of them all in a way. There's this fantastic moment in The Tempest uh, where in a banquet on the early modern stage, a banquet vanishes. I don't know if you, if you remember this scene or know this scene. Uh, and in the early text is the stage direction with a quaint device. <laughs> the banquet vanishes. Well, that's, that, that's fantastic. What's that telling us? That's telling us, telling me, in the way that I approach it, telling me that the uh, technological sophistication of being able to make a banquet vanish is an important theatrical feat. That we go there to see that. That we want to see how the banquet is going to vanish. We don't need it to be an illusion. We don't need to believe that it's magic. We actually want to see the theatricality of it. Right? That that's written into the text tells me that. Technology as performative. Okay. Technology to come to link up and finish up with something that Stuart was saying about his work. Technology is that which does not necessarily consume the world or consume meaning, consume nature, but rather produces. Produces a space of truth, produces a space, uh, an unclearing, a space for uh, a theater to make itself. 
Right? Technology makes a theater, not in the sense that it can make a banquet vanish or make a prop, but makes a theater in the sense that it allows theatricality to come forward. There's lots more, but I don't think I will go into the, the lots more of it. I think I'll wrap up with that uh, by way of, uh, and, and summarize, uh, by way of saying that this kind of project, a, a phenomenology of a theatrical convention, and the, uh, again, the phenomenology of the door, perhaps, were, were we to go there, a phenomenology of Shakespeare, a phenomenology of David Mamet, a, ph a phenomenology of anything, would ask how we encounter that thing as a whole. How does it appear to us? What are the basic irreducible things that make up Shakespearean theater in this case? And how do we encounter those things? And how do phenomenological concepts, methodologies, motifs, uh, lived body, uh, intersubjectivity, uh, unconcealment, the revealing of truth, the creation of truth, technology, how do phenomenological concepts answer those questions? So it's not a set paper. I'll stop it there, and it will go on a lot longer than I thought. I said to you, like, 45 minutes uh, this was going to take. <laughs> it took a lot longer than 45 minutes. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your attention to all of this, and we will take any further questions as you find. Okay. Thank you. Adam. Uh, first of all, thank you for that overview of your book. I just found myself, you know it's going to be a good book, and you find yourself nodding and going, ah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just the overview. Wait, and then the book might not. <laughs> uh, I, I've got two questions. Yep. First of all, um, one of the ah, moments mm. was uh, scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, if I was to, to sort of reduce it a bit, uh, feeling not meaning yes. in some respects. Yes. But um, you, you describe the scales uh, at the end of Merchant of Venice, uh, of Venice as transforming the space. Yep. And I wondered whether the reason why it was enabled to transform the space was because of meaning, because yeah. of the meanings associated with those scales, yeah. for instance, as a symbol yes. of justice, yeah. Yeah. and also the fact that we know uh, a heart yes. is going to end up on them, perhaps, yeah. or not, hopefully yes. not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's question one. I, I, is it still about meaning, and in which case, how does that relate to the phenomenal experience of scales? And question two um, was about, uh, I suppose, just a, a inviting a personal reflection on methodology. Mm. So it struck me as being, um, w when you describe, uh, underscore the plural phenomenologies, that struck me as being very important, because when mm. we think about representations of full star, for instance, mm. on the early modern stage, and then when we, we think about or, or try and empathize with what a phenomenal experience of observing full star on an early modern stage might be, and then compare that with, for instance, uh, if the Worcester group, you yes, might yes. mediatize yeah. full yes. star, yes. where yes. in a theater we, we watch full star on a screen yeah. as a mediatized presence. Um, how do you find uh, pitching, describing, empathizing yeah. with an audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the that that is the question that uh, Bruce Smith occupies himself with for the past sort of decade or so in terms of developing what is called a historical phenomenology. Is this is this possible? He, he sort of asks, posits, and and then answers yes. Uh, it. Um, I I I think that. I think it is also possible, but not necessarily in the way that Smith uh, does. I think that my approach to that right, is, again, one which says, admittedly, we cannot place ourselves in the position of an early modern audience member fully and completely. Right? What we can do is try to understand what, for example, body might mean contextually, culturally, and theatrically there. And then, uh, from that, develop on a sense of how that relationship between subject and object, in this case, audience and, and actor, for example, might be characterized, might develop. Okay? I did something similar, for example, with, uh, with the work on time in early modern theater. Time for a, an Elizabethan audience member or an Elizabethan uh, citizen, very, very different from what it is for, for us now, of course. I mean, that goes without saying. So then how do we project ourselves backwards? How do we uh, do that? Well, one of the things that you can do is consider uh, the, the cultural context and say, 
for Shakespeare's audience ten years prior to the time that Shakespeare was writing, uh, the whole of Western Europe lost eight days. Right? You had the change of calendars in which eight days completely disappear uh, when you move from one calendar system to the other. If that's possible, <laughs> if it's possible to go from October the 1st to October the 10th, uh, it might have been 11 days, I can't remember. If that's possible and to, uh, to, to assimilate and to work, even if still to talk about, then what might would that tell us about, say, the malleability of time and of temporal experience? And that is something that then one can find traces of in the plays and try to work through in the plays. Does that make some sense as a kind of uh, uh, approach? So there's, the, there's that side of it. To come back to Smith's uh, 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 idea uh, and his work on historical phenomenology, uh, what he suggests partly is that the uh, material sort of resonances of that age, the text, for example, uh, even though we've got all these problems about what text might mean and how Shakespearean text might work, but the text, for example, uh, scholarship, the very uh, uh, remains of the globe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the material resonances of that are things that we respond to, and if we understand that we're responding to them in one way, then we can understand a little bit of difference and position it. Yeah, to uh, both uh, compare and contrast with how an early modern, uh, with what an early modern experience might have been. Mm. So just to um, carry on down that path, and this also, I think this also responds quite nicely to the first question as well about the mm. scale. Um, your your means of enabling this understanding of uh, a phenomenal past, if you like, is through identifying how meaning was constructed at that time? I think it might, uh, I would put it, it's in, in identifying how experience may have been constructed at that time, rather than meaning. Uh, to come back to your first question, I think meaning and feeling is the way you put it, or meaning and, and experience are uh, really inseparable. So, so if I take up the question about the scales, for example, that might come back to the so the the scales for me yes they'll always uh, mean uh, what greed justice they'll always mean whatever their symbolic quality is that's not going to disappear the, uh, on stage or anywhere else uh, I think but by the same token when one uses a symbol like that in a particular way and in a particular setting in this case a theatrical setting a constructed uh, dramatic staged setting then the, those scales do more than mean. They actually make it unnecessary for a kind of semiotic or structural meaning to take place. The example here is uh, Heidegger's. The example is uh, the way in which he talks about the statue of the, the Greek god, that it is not necessary. The statue of the Greek god uh, is, doesn't, doesn't mean the presence of the god is around. It makes it unnecessary to refer elsewhere for the god. Uh, okay, and that's uh, the way that I'm thinking about the relationship between meaning. You can't look at Apollo and have Apollo be present in the way that Heidegger is talking without knowing what Apollo means or what the statue means or what that particular curve means. Right? It, it's a, the two things are embedded in each other. And I think that the props work the same way. Certain props work uh, the same way. I think Macbeth's daggers do that as well. Okay, uh, we were talking about this the other day, and uh, Bert States has got you know this wonderful take on Macbeth, in which he says, you know, the play does so much more than just tell you, gee, regicide is bad or crime doesn't pay. <laughs> right? There's much more to the play than that. It's much more. Th but you also can't get what more it is without knowing the meaning, if that makes some sense. So back to the method question, yes, part of it is culturally materialist, part of it is historiographical, part of it is understanding uh, those material traces, but those then are embedded in a sense of experience and in a sense of allowing something to appear to the degree possible as what it is. So, sorry, yes. Yeah, so um, I, 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 that, so. Yes, very much so. Very much so. The 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 sense of the, the for for context, the sense that uh, uh, that we always sort of operate with one, as he calls it, semiotic eye, which understands meaning, and one eye which really only not only but really uh, just perceives right, and, and takes in one phenomenological eye. Which strikes at the heart of the paradox that you're setting up. Yes. That you were uncomfortable yes. With yes. 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 But to return that to something Stuart was saying, a, a great rigor and training in that methodology might actually overturn its own methodology, <laughs> as it were, like that. Yeah.
or yeah. you might have an audience member saying, ah, this is a dagger I've seen before, then yes. often it will hurt. Yes, 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 yes. Um, well, Much, I, I think that that's true. Although, again, I would, uh, I would maybe hedge it a little bit by saying that there, particularly with Shakespearean theater, there is this an incredible uh, process of and fascination with materiality and the materiality of things that are not present, actually, which sounds like, uh, kind of strange. So the dagger example that I uh, use often with that is exactly that. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Okay, so on the Shakespearean stage, there's no dagger there. Yeah, okay, it's not there, right? Uh, but halfway through the soliloquy, I see the yet in form as palpable as that which now I draw. There's a dagger here that he's carrying, a real metal dagger prop dagger, but a dagger. So what the theater effects is this move between the immaterial and the material, right? Uh, so it's partly about memory. Yes, an audience member says, this is a dagger which I see before me, and we know what daggers are and, we, and, and meaning. But partly it's about that, uh, that ability to then conflate and draw together absence and presence, right? The, the language does that, the structure of the speech does that, the movement of the actor does that, but most importantly, in a way, the metal dagger does that, right? This now becomes that which is going to kill Duncan, right? Uh, thou marshalest me the way that I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Uh, that there, there's the, the, the absent dagger and the present one, and what the theater is doing is kind of bringing them together, if that makes some sense. What becomes really important in that process, I think, is that then the material dagger is imbued and carries all the weight of the, <laughs> the psychological, I don't like that phrase, but, but, but of the immaterial one that he started with. Mm. Uh, in a way, that would be the sort of trick of memory that I might, the, that I might want to focus on. That once I've got a real dagger that's going to really kill Duncan, right, what is carried in that is actually the imagined dagger. Mm. Does, does that make some sense? Yeah. Scale Absolutely. Scale That's right. First it just is an impression of That's the idea right. of it being a courtroom. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, uh, I think added in with that is, you know, the sense of, uh, as a, uh, planning to write about, a sense of economic determinism, right? So the scales stand in for that as well. Everything is bounded by money. Why does Bassanio want Portia? <laughs> He's out of money. <laughs> he needs a rich, a rich wife, basically. Right? Uh, so, so there's all of that embedded in there. And again, to come back to Adam's uh, point, there's the meaning is important there. But it is meaning that then conflates with and kind of becomes one with with experience, uh, and, and we don't have to say, ah, oh, I get it, oh, it's just, you, you know, the scales just mean that. It's, it's, it's not that. But the justice is a movable piece throughout yes. that entire play. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and, and throughout, in my, in my phenomenological experience. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Continue to mitigate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's right. I'm just wondering how that kind of reading is complicated by something like the ghost in Hamlet. The, the material, the, the, the reading of absence and presence, yeah, yeah very, very much complicated. <laughs> By yeah, yeah, ghosts are, uh, yeah, ghosts, man, they're great, aren't they? Uh, ghosts, uh, when I write about the body, and I've, I've trialed some of this a little bit uh, in, in an article, when I write about the body in Shakespeare, and I write about it as matter, as I said, I, uh, I think about it with respect to its occupying a kind of very unique position between the classical sense of matter and form. Right? Hamlet, and this will lead on to the ghost, Hamlet struggles with this throughout that play, right? Uh, it wants to denigrate all things material, wants to denigrate the body, is really unhappy with the body, really uncomfortable with the body, wants to elevate all things of thought, of, of mind, of, of spirit, wants to live there, right? Uh, but can't. Uh, you know, and, and the process of the play is one of his sort of oscillating between those two realms, the realms of matter and the realms of, and, and that of form. Right? And a, a Renaissance mindset understood those in very hierarchical terms, of course. Right? What happens is that the body, and particularly the heart, in the imaginings of the body, become the perfect uh, median between matter and form. The human body is that which is both. It is divine, it carries a divine spark, so it exists in the realm of form, and it is, of course, of the earth. It is, it is mundane. It's both, right? What's a ghost, uh, uh, then? A, a ghost is maybe just the flip side of that. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, a ghost is uh, the absent, which is invariably and ir um, irrefutably present. Okay. The ghost is there in Shakespeare's stage as a material body, as an actor. Okay. Uh, and that's a fantastic trick of the theater as well as of our imagination of, of ghosts. Okay. So is that ghost is not there, and especially later in the play, Gertrude doesn't see him. When we try to make Shakespeare realistic, we always have problems with this. <laughs> uh, why? That's a plot hole. That's really poor plot devising on Shakespeare's part, right? Uh, why doesn't Gertrude see him? Why does it, it must mean it's all in Hamlet's mind. It's not that at all. It's because the body and the ghost in particular can be matter or, f or form, can do that. Just like the theater can do that, can, can actually move between it. Just like the Dagon, I often actually think uh, uh, relate to the, uh, the ghost in Hamlet and Macbeth's daggers that we were just talking about. I think that they're, they're, there's a shared phenomenon uh, occurring uh, there. And that phenomenon is the oscillation between and the movement between uh, matter and form, particularly on the knife's edge, particularly on, on that point where one might turn into the other. And I think that early modern theater especially lives on that knife's edge, the relationship between substance and appearance which it is always so fascinated with, and which, I, to my mind, and of course I'm biased, that theatrical convention, Shakespearean theater, early modern theater, exploits that relationship between absence and presence, materiality and immateriality, as well, if not better, than any other theatrical convention. Right? That's my bias, of course, but uh, if one follows the argument without having to say it's the best, uh, then that's the, uh, that's the way that I think about it, that there's, a, there's something very particular to that theatrical convention that says we can be nothing and something at the same time. Right? And so I think the ghost is a, a kind of perfect example and a perfect iteration of that in some respects as are most supernatural things in Shakespeare. The witches, they are of the air, they vanish. How the hell do the witches vanish in that play on Shakespeare's stage? What do they do? Right? Today we can make, it's easy, it's easy to make a witch vanish on stage today. What happens then? How does it vanish? The best answer we can come up with is that the witch, that I can come up with is that the witches vanish because we are told they vanish. Right? Uh, so, uh, so what does that say about the presence of the body, the material body and its, its materiality? Yeah, so that's where the, this thing goes. In a way, all of this comes back to your question, Adam, about how we, uh, a methodological question about how one might think through a phenomenological approach to something that we can't possibly be a part of uh, 400 years gone. No. Sorry, you asked me to riff, and I probably riffed too much. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you both for really nourishing this whole afternoon. Um, the way that you got me thinking about setting up the historical perspective of the personality and this thing of the relation of the object and then philosophizing, you know, the subject object position, the cup and that. And then when you're talking about the phenomenology of Shakespeare, and I've been doing, I dealt with phenomenology of dance, and thinking about the object of dance, which mm. doesn't really exist like a cup. Mm. Mm. So to, it, it just, like choreography is transmitted between people. It's, it's not a thing that mm. I, I can grasp in that mm. same objective mm. way. And I was just wondering if you had any reflections on that with your historical perspective and mm. the thing of phenomenal mm. of Shakespeare mm. and how much of it is it not there. It's there because of all of it that makes it up that you're breaking down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is performance a thing, <coughs> effectively? Uh, is, is either you know, Shakespearean theater or dance, as you're saying, a thing that we can have the same kind of relationship to that we were playing around with the cup, that Stuart was playing around with the cup earlier? Is that the question? Is that the... Yeah. the, yeah. the I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if it's really yeah, a question or just you uh, just uh, call it that yeah, yeah, idea. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I, I think that's part of performance's beauty, mm. potentially, mm. is the way that it... Are you doing the body weather and the, the way that you, you become subject object with mm. the environment and potentially? I I, no, I think that that's right. I, I suppose right. my, I mean, uh, well, let's do it, jump in here in a second. But my, res my reaction to that would be the, basically to agree, would be to say, yes, I think that that's part of performance, that's part of the beauty of performance. Uh, but I, I think, I guess what I really think is that the, 
the way in which we allow performance to appear to us, the way in which we allow it to come forward, is for me the, the question. You know? What does that mean? That means that I can't take all uh, performances all the time. Right? I can't understand Shakespearean theater almost even in the ways that I'm, that I'm describing it here as one single thing. It must be uh, understood as somewhat individuated, but that causes a problem. If we were to stop there, we'd never be able to say anything uh, about it. Right? So we can't stop there. We have to say, what are the trends? What are the uh, uh, commonalities uh, amongst performances? And we count those, perhaps, as the, the substance, the cup, uh, that, that we look at. Right? I'm not sure if I'm getting at your question. And I'm not sure, Stuart, if you want to jump in uh, on this um, at all. I'm not sure what you mean. Um, the, um, there's a lot of phenomenology of dance. And what is the phenomenology of dance about? It's about movement, mostly. Um, and the debate started by Maxine about um, uh, that you can't have an image. You can't have an eidetic image of dance. You can't reduce dance to an, an essence because it's in the movement or something like that. Is that what you, the debate you're uh, referring to? But I think that that's yeah, I think that's right, and I think that that's the question that is is troubling for all of performance. You know, I mean, by by talking about a, a phenomenology of Shakespearean theatre, I am necessarily and inevitably uh, homogenizing something, right? Not only homogenizing all Shakespearean performances in, in a way, but also uh, things that are, I think, the point that you're getting at, uh, ephemeral, right? Uh, yeah, performance. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, performance doesn't stay for us to, to, to look at. But the history, of course, of the uh, study of performance uh, both battles with that problem, and overcomes it, and then battles with it again, and then overcomes it. Uh, uh, and, and I think that actually phenomenology offers a way, if not necessarily overcoming it, of accepting that as part and parcel of what performance is, and then saying, OK, fine, what can we say about this now? If that I mean, makes that's some sense. That's the phenomenological approach, is what's there, what's yeah. going on. Yeah. What is it about this thing that makes it what it is? And so this um, uh, <coughs> necessitates Anna's project of last week, of uh, just what is dance, the ontology of dance. That's, and that's what drives her. The same problem that you've got, what am I actually talking about? But if you go to Maxine Sheets Johnson's really early essay on man has always danced, that essay, um, what is it that man has always done that constitutes this dance is the question you should go. And it seems like if you took her work, you'd be talking about um, a sense of, a qualitative sense of movement. Um, and uh, in some, some toing and froing that I had with her, I used some stuff from Husserl's Ideas 1 on, um, uh, what are they called? Um, uh, it's a certain kind of image it's, um, that Husserl writes about. I, um, God, I should know this. I wrote articles about it. Um, <laughs> uh, Idetic, they're, <coughs> I can't remember the name of them, but I'll, I'll get back to you on it. But these are, Images to do with inexact non-mathematical measurements that um, uh, scallop-shaped, umbelly form. These are the examples that Husserl uses. And when I work with dancers, and I work with dancers all the time, um, there's always this reduction to sort of like little pieces of series of things. Okay, so. We've got this thing, Tester Quincy, when I was working with her, she had this thing called horse buttocks. But there were two versions of horse buttocks. There was horse buttocks with a mm, and horse buttocks with a zh. 
And um, so I thought, okay, well, what's the difference between hawk's buttocks with a n and horse buttocks with a zh? And she was using this to communicate to the dancer in the choreography, the difference between the n and the zh. And she was touching the dancer at the same time and moving the dancer's body to illustrate the difference between the n and the zh. And so it seemed to me that these, that what she was dealing with was where she was dealing with imprecise yet not inexact mm. imagery. Mm. And so imprecise, net, yet, no, yeah, inexact yet not imprecise, mm. sorry. Mm. So it's not a mathematical science mm. that you're talking about, mm. but it's very, very precise. Mm. And so this was just an example of a way in that I used phenomenology to talk about a dance mm. process. Mm. Um, and what it was about was about the fact of the way in which it used a language of essences. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, and I think... Oh, sorry. My um, Amazon for my course mate is English Fusion. I also do exploring the question of different classes. Mm. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 But I, I think this is the, the... This is the... But this is the thing that drew me in the first place, however many years ago it was, to, to phenomenology. And I hadn't had those terms but I think that that's exactly it, right? The ability, precisely because I study and am interested in performance, right? The ability to say, yes, this is what this thing is, right? which postmodernism, again, kind of taught us that we can't do. I'll set that aside for a second. The ability to say, yes, this is what this thing is, without uh, mathematically quantifying it. Right? That seems to me and many people might argue, it's very debatable still, whether or not that's possible, uh, admirable, desirable, but that seems to me to be a great thing for our field, if that makes some sense. Right? Because it is a subjective, as I said earlier, subjective study. It is something that is ephemeral and not lasting. We don't have an object the way one has a painting or, or, or a novel uh, or a poem. We don't have that. So the ability to say, ah, yes, this is what's happening, right? Uh, with at least a strong degree of authority or certainty in the statement, this is what's happening, without having to say it's happening because I can quantify. And this is an incredible practice in the late 19th century, some of it is still going on, uh, of mathematically charting uh, Shakespeare's uh, use of uh, verse, right? Uh, in terms of rhythm, punctuation, uh, there, there are all of these incredible charts, on it, which always struck me as well, possibly interesting, but totally beside the point. <laughs> uh, totally and utterly beside the point. And it, it, that, that, that lands us in the world of meaning, and only meaning, to come back to states' as binocular vision, only the, the, the semiotic eye, I think. But what Stuart's talking about, and I think the question you're asking, which I think is actually exactly the right question and a difficult question, is, is about how can, we, how can we have our cake and eat it too, right, in a way. Morphological, I think, is, is what, uh, what I used to talk about dance. Morphological what, essences. Morphological essences. It's in yeah, ideas one. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. But the yeah. phenomenology of dance is mostly about bodies, isn't it? It's an, an but dance itself is, is not a, a body, it is a... It's a movement, it's a pro... But see, this, it, this is something you didn't... Matter, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. But this is, in a way, we're way over time now, but, but this is, <laughs> in a way, something that we didn't get to, Stuart, that you and I were talking about, and that was sort of a, 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 sitting just underneath all of this. You mentioned it briefly. It's that, you know, certainly from Heidegger, Everything about phenomenology is about process, it's about verb, right? Mm -hmm. Everything about it is active, not about pinning it down. And again, that's another part of its attraction for me, right? Okay? Because to say this is what something is, yes, this is happening, is not to say I, it's, it's the end all and be all, done. We never need to write another word about dance or Shakespeare or anything like that. Be, and it's not that precisely you can say this is what it is and not have it be the end all and be all precisely because it is the, the verb, precisely because it is active, if that makes some sense. Right? Whereas one might not be able to do that with a painting or, or a, a novel. Maybe one can, but I'm not in those fields. Well, since it's all I think would be perhaps an unanswerable question, perhaps we debate when people like Philip Anselm about why yes. it's yeah. 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 says more about our understanding of yeah. what performance, what constitutes performance, 
and what what it is as a thing. Yeah. You know, rather than actually answering the question, it, it does perhaps go go more to say that we do understand some or of it because it's something that we're keen on retaining, yeah, yeah. rather than leaning into a digitised yeah. age where that doesn't exist anymore. Mm. I think uh, uh, Anna answered that really, really beautifully last week. That um, uh, the traditional uh, continental philosophy approach, which actually produced the Auslander problem and liveness, um, is if something is not, if something does not leave some sort of material after trace, then it somehow has got to do with absence. And, and all of our study of that has uh, gone from there. And in my own work, I deal a lot with the temporality of it. To me, all this, all this stuff is just a question of time and nothing else, and a definition of time and, and a kind of a slippage between different definitions of time. But uh, speaking to Anna about what she said afterwards is an analytic philosopher would go methodically through and would go, okay, and the idea of this is the performance of this piece and this performance of this piece is not that performance of this piece, but they are both performances of this piece. And so um, what constitutes this piece as this piece? What are the borders of this piece? And the analytic philosopher would break it down like that and then that would it comes into their question, as she put it, do you talk about types and tokens or do you talk about the numeralization and these terms from analytic philosophy, they go, no, no, no. This stuff is not about absence. It is not about a lack of existence. It exists, but you have to talk about the precise mode of its existence. And I found that incredibly refreshing and invigorating last week on Anna's paper. Yeah. Mm. So mm. Yes. I mean, it's, it yes. comes back to your anxiety about. Yeah. The, is it the resistance of performance? Is it yeah. processuality yeah. to this application of a method? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Notion of fundamental elements. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Is there I fundamental processes? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right, and it's implicit in the stuff that mm. I read today. There's it's almost this little sort of me yelping away, going. Look, Heidegger's process too. Heidegger's process too. <laughs> um, in it to to yeah. sort of make it belong there. Mm. We should wrap up. Yes, yes. It's been a marathon for both of yeah. you, and um, but thank you both um, enormously for your, your generosity in, in sharing your, your work with us. Mm. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Great.